This video is sponsored by no one. The computer reviewed is one I purchased and wanted to share my thoughts with you. Special thanks to all who have subscribed to the channel. We hit over 200 this past week. Browsing Amazon deals, I found a mini PC that caught my eye. It was going for $119, but had a $50 coupon, so I ended up paying only $69 for it. I don't know exactly what brand this is supposed to be, as the listing says generic, but at the time of purchase it was also number one in many PCs on the site. I've seen videos on this design before, and there is one aspect of it that I'd like to see, but is often skipped. It arrived with labels just slapped on the outside of the box. The computer comes configured with an Intel Celeron J3455, 6GB of DDR3 RAM, a 128GB SSD, dual band Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.2. Accessories include a VESA adapter, HDMI cable, power supply, screws, and a user's guide. On the front, there's one USB 2 and two USB 3 ports, along with a clicky power switch. Along the other side is an area for a Kensington lock, an audio jack that looks like it could be TRRS, Gigabit Ethernet, dual HDMI, another USB 2 port, and power. Along one side that the camera can't focus on is a light bar, with the other side being blank. Underneath is an opening for the CPU fan, as well as the slide hooks for the VESA mount bracket. Getting inside to add a 2.5 inch SSD is fairly easy. There would normally be one screw to remove, but it's missing on this one, so all we have to do is slide this lever and take the top off. Inside is the SATA connector, and beside it is a USB-C port. I've not seen anyone trying to use that port before, but why it's inside I have figured out. There are some variations that have a separate module to put the SATA SSD in, and it plugs into the USB-C port. Since this machine doesn't have that, does the port work? I'll explore that after testing Windows 10 Pro that comes pre-installed. Windows started up with no issues. The system SSD has 27 hours on it, and a health reading of zero as reported by Crystal Disk Info. Speeds are about what I'd expect for a SATA device. Benchmarking with CPU-Z, the single thread score was 169.0 and a multi-thread of 665.1. That is a modest improvement over the previous reviewed Byte Nook. Cinebench R23 is where I was surprised. Single core came in at 262 points with a multi-CPU score of 923 points. That is almost 300 more points than the Byte Nook with its N3450. Inside Ubuntu Linux, the Sysbench CPU benchmark came in with 1192 events per second single core and 4546 with all four cores. Geekbench 5 for Linux scored it at 337 single and 1227 multi-core. Here is a comparison chart for all the CPU benchmarks between the ByteNook AK34 and the generic AK2. After running the benchmarks, I finally decided to connect the network and run some updates. Feels like the first time. The first time of doing this takes a while. After 30 minutes, I left for the store, and when I returned two hours later, it was finished. Going into advanced driver downloads, I see two different Dell monitor drivers available. While I do have this hooked up to a monitor, it's going through a capture device which ends up showing as a generic plug and play monitor in the device manager. This is another indication it was set up by someone then the out of box experience utility was used. One thing installed through updating is PC Health Checker. Let's see if this can upgrade to Windows 11. The results say no, but it's only for the processor. The J3455 was released in 2016, a year behind the 8th generation core processors that are the minimum requirements for Windows 11 at this time. YouTube playback wasn't bad either. It handled my 4K 30fps sample without dropping frames. The frame drops with my 4K 60fps video wasn't bad, and visually they were hard to see. Going down to 1440p things look good. 
and while it still dropped frames at 1080-60fps, it wasn't that bad. So YouTube at 1080 should work fine with this AK2. The bias is actually pretty good. It was interesting to see that CPU C states weren't enabled by default. Changing that, I was able to squeeze out another watt or so of power savings. I tried out the USB-C port under Linux and Windows, and the only thing it looked like it did was provide power. I didn't see any option in the BIOS for it either, so it looks like I have my answer. It can't be used. What is interesting though, from the LSPCI command in Linux, I can see a micro SD reader chip somewhere on the board, but not the hardware to use it. I tore into the machine and took out the motherboard. Storage is on a 128GB M SATA drive. The CPU cooler is held on by three screws, and under there we can see the CPU die, soldered on SK Hynx RAM, and the Wi-Fi card sits just behind it. CPU only got up to 56 degrees during a Cinebench run, so the cooler does a pretty good job. I still believe there could be security issues with these mini PCs, but one of the best things you can do from any manufacturer is reinstall Windows, overriding everything. For little systems like this though, getting drivers could be an issue. While I don't have plans to use this as a Windows machine, I did decide to see what all issues a fresh install would cause. I launched the installer from within Windows, and I think this took about 5 times longer than just booting and installing from the install media. Will this give a system that is up to date and not as old as maybe my USB install image would set up? Turns out there were still a few updates to apply, and I also installed the 22H2 update and have seen no issues. As for the drivers, there are 3 items in the device manager that aren't working, but I could find no evidence that it made any difference in usability. All networking, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, sound, and USB ports all worked. Power consumption under Ubuntu Super was as low as 3 watts, with power up to 12 watts running Geekbench. In Windows, I was also able to get as low as 3 watts at idle once C states were enabled in the BIOS, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth were turned off. For the price, this seems like a nice little machine that could do web surfing and document editing until Windows 10 hits end of life and probably work well as a low-power Linux desktop after that. I'm not planning on using this as a window machine, but more on that in a future video. Tell me what you think. Would you take a gamble on a no-name computer for $70? How is this review? I know the benchmarks might not say much to most, and that is why I tried to do a YouTube playback test. Let me know if you have any questions, or just put duck down in the comments. Leave a like if you found the video helpful, and consider subscribing if you like content like this. I'm excited that subscriber count has grown by 34 in the past month. That's it for today's video. Until next time, they call me Good Monkey. Thanks for watching. I hope that it wasn't terrible. and it's sleeping but it's got a red light <laughs>